Joining me this evening is a guy that was living a normal life until one night in 2008. Something happened which changed his life forever. Nick Driscoll is the guy, and he joins me tonight on Late Night Graham Torrington. Nick, thank you very much, Dave, for coming onto the programme tonight. Thank you for the invitation, Graham. So let's go back to prior 2008 then. Uh, tell me about life. How was life? Um, life was good. You know, just as anybody else, you have your ups and downs, but generally overall it was a, it was a pretty good life. Fairly <laughs> successful in business. And then 2008. How old were you in 2008? I would have been 35. Okay. 34, 35. What happened in 2008? Um, I, I met up with friends, <clears throat> as you do on a Friday night, um, and we went to Bar 7 in Schiffnall. Uh, I have no memory, I have to tell you at this point. I can just tell you what I've been told um, and from the reports I've read. Hmm. Uh, I was attacked in Bar 7 in Schiffnall in Shropshire. Uh, it wasn't so much the attack that did, did anything detrimental to me. It was more falling back and hitting my head on the concrete where I suffered a contra coup brain injury where my brain hit the front of my skull. Um, I suffered a brain... Uh, sorry, I suffered a, a skull fracture and also two brain hemorrhages. We'll come on to the hospitalisation in a few moments' time. And yeah. uh, I know that you said that this is only what people have told you, but mm -hmm. at this point now, do we know what happened to you? Uh, in, in what respect, Graham? I just I only know that I was, um, in relation to the attack, it was an unprovoked attack. Um, I play guitar and sing. And bar seven had become like a, my local, so I'd taken a guitar and we'd often sit around and with lots of people we'd just have a bit of a sing song. Okay. So so what I'm told is um a person came and didn't like the attention I was getting or something. I don't really know. Um right. I just have to this is speculation. Um but because of obviously I was in the wrong place at the wrong time and they felt that they could pick on me. Okay. Well, do, do, do you know what they did to you? I just understand that I was punched, but with, with such a, a great impact that I fell backwards and hit my head on the concrete. Right. OK, so you were taken off to hospital, and yeah. what were the doctors saying to you or to those around you? Because at this point, were you conscious, not conscious? Um, again, I have very little memory. I've, I've got all the doctors, all the records from hospital and doctors afterwards because I needed to understand what happened. But what I understand is I went into Telford, uh, Princess Royal Hospital, and they discharged me. Um, I went to my mother's, where I slept for approximately 48 hours. Mm. Um, and when I woke up, I went home, but then I was talking complete gibberish. Mm. Uh, a friend of mine, Joe Green, came round, and I was talking complete gibberish, so they tried to get me back into hospital, and that's when I went back in. So at this point, you, do, you don't remember any of this? No, I have no memory whatsoever, for about, about a month, actually. Right. To, to those around you, yes, you were talking yeah. gibberish, but w were you carry on, carrying on pretty much a normal life as possible, obviously with the injuries? Yeah, of course. It's, um, with, with brain damage, you kind of think you're the same. You, don't act, you can't recognise the difference in yourself. Um, the more you recover from brain damage, the more you start to understand that something's wrong. Right. So for, <clears throat> excuse me, I didn't actually get proper help until about four years afterwards. So for four years, I was trying to lead my life as the person I was before. Okay. Because my understanding was I was the same person. But what I understood is, again, with a traumatic brain injury, is you lose the person you were and you have to recreate yourself. Right. At this time, these four years leading up to you being diagnosed with a brain injury. Sorry, they did a CT scan, so they knew I'd had two brain hemorrhages. Right. Uh, I was in hospital for a week, um, but after that point, they lost me in the system, and I was no follow-up appointment, so I had to carry on without education or treatment, basically, yeah. For how long for? For the four years. Um, four years? Yeah, they, uh, I went to the doctors a few times, um, suggesting, you know, I've got this problem, I've got that problem. They sent me for MRI, and they spotted severe brain damage, like scar tissue on my frontal, right frontal and temporal lobes. Hmm. Um, but no follow-up sort of uh, treatment was <clears throat> was given to me at that point. And it wasn't until four years afterwards where, unfortunately, I tried to take my own life that um, social services got involved. And, and the wonderful people at West Park Rehabilitation Hospital in Wolverhampton took me under the wing and helped me rehabilitate, giving me education on what was actually going on. Quite a journey you've been through, really, then, isn't it? 
Yeah, yeah. Um, when when I got to to the West Park Rehabilitation Hospital, what I understood that I was also going through severe depression, severe anxiety, as well as post traumatic stress disorder. So you can imagine the sort of journey over four years of not not knowing what was wrong. It's like having a broken leg, but not knowing it's broken. Just mm. just having the pain, basically. And once you started to get the treatment, what sort of treatment were you receiving? Uh, well, the first part was education. They um, they educated me about what was going on. So <clears throat> if you imagine being in a, in a black room, in a dark room, trying to fight a black cat, you can't see it, it keeps scratching you. So you, you can't do anything about it. You can't find a solution to something you don't know that's wrong. So the first port of call was for them to educate me on what had actually happened, uh, as well as do some tests on my brain functions, where they spotted lots of different things. The main, the main thing was my brain was processing slower, so the memory issues were the biggest thing because I'd forget what I'd done. Mm. So the education came first, and they also helped. They came out and helped me at home. They helped me get into routines um, and and that sort of stuff. What about the people very close to you? Do you have a partner? Uh, I do now. At the time, I didn't, unfortunately. <laughs> Okay, and what about those close to you, family, friends? <clears throat> what were they seeing uh, about you, who, and what have they said to you since then? Well, it, well, again, I think because they obviously understood I'd had brain hemorrhages, but the sort of severity of the brain damage was not diagnosed and I wasn't getting help. Nobody really knew. They just knew I wasn't right. Um, and they were kind of waiting for me to get better, just hoping that things would be okay. Right. Now, during this time, were you able to work? Um, on and off, uh, I've, before before the brain injury, I was I was um, very successful in work and never never lost a job. But over a period of the four years, I lost you know I'd start a job but then not be very good at it, or or the fatigue would kick in, so I'd get tired and not be able to process information correctly, things like that. So I was working, but it was on and off, very very sporadic. So financially, then not a good time for you either. No, not really. No, it was a difficult time. And again, being successful, you're used to having a level of living. So not having that level of living is quite, um, what's the word? Disgruntling is the best word. You mentioned getting to uh, a deep depression. T tell me about those days and those nights. Um, well, anybody that suffered depression, the best way to describe it is a big black cloud arrives. And... <clears throat> You, you kind of start to believe that people are better off without you. You're not understanding why it's going on. You have no control over your mood swings. So you become quite isolated in that respect. Um, over time, you remove yourself more and more from society. So <clears throat> the feeling of being helpless is probably the biggest and most obvious description I can give you. Mm. Helpless and hopeless are the two words I'd use. Pretty dark days for you. Without question. Um, in, in fairness, it's built me to the person I am today. I've become very empathetic and in my work now I help people. So it's, it's the past is the past, but it shapes your future. What you do about the past is, is what matters. Now, when did you realise you were actually starting to get better then, Nick? It's, it's a continual process, Graham. I've got to, I've got to be honest with you. <clears throat> um, I'm, I'm far further forward than I was four years ago and every day in every way I get a little bit stronger and a little bit better so I think when West Park educated me understanding it was almost like turning the light on in that room we spoke about in the black room so I could yeah. see the cat so now I was able to avoid it and and things like coping strategies um, you know this is going to happen so therefore you do something before etc 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 so probably four or five years is when things started to turn around and the slow journey of recovery began what happened to the people who attacked you um they didn't find them they didn't find the person unfortunately all right what do you think Which about again, that person what do you think about that person uh if you'd have asked me this question a few years ago <clears throat> there was a lot of hatred um and fear because because i didn't know who it was the PTSD came because I would be out and I wouldn't know who it was. So it could be anybody. So I was very fearful that that person would recognise me and do it again. Right. But now I feel sorry for them. I feel I feel sorry for them and I feel, you know, sort of love towards them because they must be in a bad place themselves in order to have inflicted that on somebody else. 
at what point did you want to start helping people like you yourself? It's probably about about two or three years ago. Um, I started to understand that a lot of people have been through something similar, not necessarily brain injury, but um, <clears throat> you know the depression and the anxiety, for example. Um, and they were also going through similar journeys to me. So I began I began to train in things like clinical hypnotherapy, as well as uh, past trauma um, therapies uh, like IEMT, and and a little bit about sort of the psychology and things like that. Hmm. So the more I trained, the more I understood, and people just started to come to me for help. And it, I was able to help them very quickly. So it was. Um, you know, when you've been through something as traumatic as that, to be able to help people is, is wonderful. It's kind of your own therapy, in a way. There will be people listening to you right now on my programme tonight, Nick, who mm -hmm. can identify exactly what you've been through because they're going through it themselves right now. Yeah. As you say, it may not be uh, the brain condition that you went through there or the attack or anything like that, but we're talking about depression here as well because yeah. it's one of those things you can't see. If somebody breaks a leg, breaks an arm, you can yeah. see that. You put a plaster on it and everybody feels yeah. sorry for you. But depression, you don't see it, do you? No, it's almost like an invisible disability. And also the, the socially, social perception of, of... Unless you've suffered depression, the social sort of mentality of depression is you pull yourself up, dust yourself off, come on, pick yourself up, stop being so, so weak. Hmm. That's the broad sort of um, perception of... Uh, depression we've all had a low day in our time when it gets to the point where you can't pick yourself up because you no longer have the strength that's when it turns into depression uh, and what do you need to do when you reach that point get help and talk to people um, it can be very isolating because you feel hopeless and you feel helpless right. um, but there are many many organizations out there and people that can help you the more you suffer in silence, the more you become isolated, the more you feel alone, and, and it kind of becomes a downward spiral. What are the strategies to, to get yourself? Because it has to come from within you, doesn't it? Um, it does, it does. And when you are in a deep, dark depression, um, it's very difficult to see the wood through the trees. Um, my, my advice to people is, is just search deep inside yourself and find your inner strength, because it's there somewhere. Right. You have new patterns of behaviour going on. You have um, chemical um, reactions that aren't normal in your brain. <clears throat> Just have hope and belief that you can make a difference. And the, the change is only going to come from your actions. So the more you're willing to do, the more you can help yourself. Right. And can people be carrying on pretty normal lives, pretty normal jobs, and still going through what you're explaining right now? Yeah, of course. We're, we're, we're a resilient race, aren't we, the human beings? Um, <clears throat> we're, very, we're very good at hiding things, aren't we? You, mm. you probably know from the stories you've had on your show before. Yeah. Uh, and also from people you know, we're very good at putting on a brave face. We have the mask, don't we? Yeah. And we kind of... Uh, the, the British mentality is stiff up a lip, put up and shut up. We just, we just kind of try and get on with stuff as best we can. And is it a slow process? It's not something that happens overnight. It's not like flicking a switch and, oh, I don't have depression anymore. Is it a gradual thing that you have to pull yourself out of? It, it takes time. It takes effort. Um, for example, exercise is great. Nutrition is great. Um, but these things take time. So it is a, a gradual process and you have to keep working at it. There's a wonderful video on YouTube actually called The Black Dog um, Depression, which gives a good indication of what it's like. Okay. It's almost like you have to train the depression like a dog. Right. So well, well worth checking out if that's where you feel you are. Yeah, right without, <clears throat> without question. It, um, it helps people understand they're not alone because one of the biggest things of depression is you do feel on your own yeah. and you do feel isolated. Finally, Nick, what about yeah. you? How's your depression now and what's your future? Um, it's, it's, it's got better. Obviously, we said before I have good days and bad days, um, but I'm aware of, of what what happens during that time and I'm aware of when it arrives and what I have to do to put it to put it right. Um, working with people has, has become my my mission in life to help them have relief from what I've been through and what they're going through. So it's very rewarding in the sense I, I help people and it, I see it working. 
wonderful. That must be very empowering to you. It is. If, if you can take the worst day of your life, which obviously on, on April um, the 13th, 2008, was the worst day of my life in the following years, if you can take a negative experience and turn it into the best day of your life by doing something with that trauma, it's a good way to recover. Wow. Absolutely. Nick, it's been great to talk to you tonight on the programme, and I thank you very much, Steve, for coming on to the show tonight.